Okay, good morning. I'm Laura Moses, a member of the forum committee, filling in today for Simon Lewis. The title of today's forum is Abortion and Women's Health in Irish History. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Kara DeLay is a professor of history at the College of Charleston with degrees from Boston College and Brandeis University. Her research analyzes women, gender, and culture in 19th and 20th century Ireland, Britain, and the Atlantic world with a particular focus on the history of reproduction, pregnancy, and childbirth. She's published multiple scholarly articles in a wide range of academic journals and has edited, written, or co-written three books, including her latest, co-authored with Beth Sundstrom, titled Birth Control, What Everyone Needs to Know. At the College of Charleston, Dr. DeLay teaches courses on women's history and the history of birth and bodies. The recipient of grants and awards from the American, Universe, American Association of University Women and the American Conference for Irish Studies, Dr. DeLay has also held a Fulbright research position at the University College Dublin Humanities Institute in Ireland. And in spring 2020, she was a visiting professor in Corpus Christi College at the University of Cambridge. So please put your questions and comments in the chat and Kara will address them at the end. Thank you so much for that introduction, Laura. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm really thrilled to be invited to talk about what I do with you all today. And especially, um, you know, with Charleston's Unitarian Church, which has uh, such an impact in the community and such a social justice focus. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, I'll start sharing my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I wanna give you before I start today, just a, a brief content warning. This presentation does include some descriptions um, of illegal abortion methods and procedures, but there are not any graphic images. Um, so today, uh, as Laura was saying, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my research in Irish women's history and specifically abortion <clears throat> history, excuse my allergies. Um, and as you may know, um, in May 2018, the Republic of Ireland voted overwhelmingly in a popular referendum to overturn the country's notoriously restrictive anti-abortion policies. Um, during the 2018 repeal celebrations in the aftermath of this popular vote that decriminalized abortion in Ireland, a lot of people, um, public speakers, described the vote as this momentous break with the past. So the Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, um, for example, in a celebration at Dublin Castle after the referendum, gave a speech in which he said, today is, quote, a day when we say no more, no more lonely journeys across the Irish Sea, no more stigma as the veil of secrecy is lifted, and no more isolation as the burden of shame is gone. <clears throat> but although it was referenced frequently in the lead up to and then the aftermath of the Island's legislative changes, the past was rarely discussed in any detail. Indeed, historical analyses of Irish women's reproductive and sexual lives, and particularly abortion, remain scarce. Little is known about Irish women's experiences of reproduction in the past, and also understudied is an analysis of how women felt, thought, and communicated about reproduction and fertility control. <clears throat> In part, this is because most studies of abortion in Ireland and beyond highlight the political movements, policy initiatives, and legislative changes that marked important turning points in the 20th century. So while these are undeniably important topics, the focus on what historian Amy Krauss has called the fetish of legality in abortion scholarship has at times caused us to ignore ordinary experiences and lived realities. Moreover, those scholars who have taken at face value sources produced by legal and medical authorities may assume that abortions were rare during illegality or that abortion was universally condemned and generally fatal. This is simply not true. Leslie Reagan, working on the United States, reminds us that there would be no history of abortion to tell without the continuing demand for abortion by women, regardless of law. 
<clears throat> so today I'm talking to you about my current research on abortion in Irish history with a woman-centered perspective trying to move beyond this fetish of legality. In this project, I look at Irish women's experiences of abortion um, on Irish soil in the 20th century with a particular focus on the period from 1900 to 1967. Um, in 1967, the Abortion Act in the UK decriminalized abortion there. So after 1967, thousands of Irish women every year traveled to Britain for abortions. Um, there's been some research done on those travel experiences, but far less done on what happened before 1967 in the island. So just to give you some context here, abortion in Ireland was illegal north and south until 2019. Most um, of the cases that I'm gonna to talk to you about today were prosecuted under the 1861 Offenses Against the Person Act, which was the first act that, de that I'm sorry, criminalized abortion in the UK and Ireland. In 1983, the Republic of Ireland criminalized abortion a second time with the Eighth Amendment, which equated the life of the mother with the life of the fetus. And it was that amendment that was repealed in 2018 in Ireland, paving a way for um, legal abortion. So again, after 1967, thousands of Irish women traveled to Britain for abortion services. Um, and we know a little bit more about their experiences, but my question is what happened before 1967? So there's been this tendency in Irish history to say we didn't have abortion in Ireland before women were able to travel to Britain for it. That of course is not true. Um, so this research focuses on criminal court cases that I've looked at in the National Archives of Ireland and in um, archives in Northern Ireland as well. Um, and so the court trials that resulted from illegal abortion prosecutions in Ireland are my main source base. There's about 150 court trials that I'm looking at island-wide. So I want to give you my main points um, of the research so far and then walk you through some examples and some more specific details. So my research so far, and it's going to be a, a book draft hopefully by the end of the summer, um, reveals that um, determination and planning characterized women's abortion attempts. So some scholars like Kate Fisher have called abortion um, a careless gamble or an irrational act of desperation. This is absolutely not true in Ireland and beyond. My research demonstrates that abortion was ordinary. It was woven, in fact, into the fabric of daily life and even domestic health care, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Ireland also, my research shows, fit within transnational patterns. Um, in terms of popular attitudes to abortion, which were actually, um, you know, pretty uh, what we might call uh, supportive or lenient, and the methods that women used to procure abortion, and in the importance of community networks. So we see these developments pretty much anywhere we have, um, you know, illicit or criminal abortion activity. So my research therefore challenges what scholars call Irish exceptionalism, the notion that you know, other places may have had things like sexual deviancy, abortion, um, but Ireland didn't. Uh, you may know that, you know, the 20th century Irish state was one that was very much linked with the Catholic church. And there's been a tendency by some scholars to say that, you know, this sort of Catholic ethos and morality um, precluded the development of so-called deviant sexual practices. That's absolutely not true. Um, okay. so. When I look at um, the Irish case, um, you know, it's hard to look at overview in terms of statistics. So we don't have any reliable statistics in terms of numbers of women who sought abortions, who got abortions. Um, you know, of course, these are not um, recorded under illegality unless something goes wrong. So the cases that make it into the historical record are the rare cases, the ones in which um, something goes wrong medically and therefore a woman comes to the attention of medical authorities and then legal authorities. So we know that um, the abortion rate across the period was probably pretty high because um, it's likely that many if not more abortions went smoothly and remained under the radar, right? So we have access to the rare cases. We know there are many more. We also have evidence suggesting that abortion was pretty common in Ireland under illegality because several Irish women who were accused in criminal courts 
admitted to previous abortions before they were actually caught. So in a 1936 Belfast case, for example, the accused woman told the court that, quote, apart from other girls that I have done, I have done this four times on myself and I am still living, end quote. All of these sources affirm that abortion was widespread and practiced by women of um, diverse backgrounds, different marital status, age, economic backgrounds, region, and religion. And one striking characteristic of women um, seeking abortions is that about half of them were married and almost all of those married women who were seeking abortions already had other children. And again, this fits with some transnational patterns. There are some distinct regional differences across the island to note. Um, so it, across most of the island outside of urban centers, um, outside of Dublin specifically, abortion networks primarily involved procedures not done by so-called backstreet practitioners, um, but actually by neighbors, family members, nurses, other women. These abortions usually occurred in women's homes and testified to what I call the persistence of women's traditional health networks. So this notion that we have of you know, the backstreet practitioner um, did exist in Ireland, but only in certain decades in Dublin. Island-wide, the vast majority of abortion seekers were from the working classes or economically depressed rural areas. So we don't see middle-class or elite women represented in criminal abortion cases probably because they actually had access to travel to other places or had the resources to pay doctors to do the procedure um, for them in a medical setting. It may surprise you to hear that Irish courts actually demonstrated real reluctance to try women who aborted or attempted to abort their fetuses. Um, when they did prosecute abortion cases, they focused on bringing to justice abortionists or any accomplices who procured drugs or set up illegal procedures. But still, even then, conviction rates island-wide were remarkably low. And in fact, authorities almost uniformly proved reluctant to convict alleged offenders, even when clear evidence existed, and even when the defendant had admitted to the crime. The one exception to that was if a woman died. So in those cases, it was much more likely um, for a conviction to occur. So women's experiences of abortion, which is what I'm really interested in looking at most, depended on their circumstances, the marital status, economic situation, how far along they were in the particular pregnancy, who was performing the abortion and who was present during the attempt, how far they had to travel for the abortion and the space in which the procedure was performed all contributed to individual experiences. Abortion methods and procedures varied widely as well. Um, but there are some patterns we can talk about in terms of methods or procedures. So the most striking thing that I found so far is that most women confronting unwanted pregnancies did not immediately go to a so-called backstreet practitioner or seek an instrumental abortion. Instead, most tried to, and this is the language that they used, take care of the problem themselves um, by consuming abortion-causing substances called abortifacients. Consuming substances rather than selecting more invasive procedures was a clear choice made by women for various reasons. Um, first of all, these attempts were less likely to result in hospital visits and therefore to be detected by authorities. Women believed them to be, um, you know, consuming substances to be far safer than instrumental abortions, um, which is true. Instrumental abortions also were understood to involve more physical effects, recovery time, time off from work. Um, and just to give you an example here, in Dublin in 1930, for example, a woman named Mary O went to see a man named Rasfara for help with her unwanted pregnancy. Um, the man offered Mary a choice between a sort of instrumental method or abortifacient pills. And Mary later testified in court, I said I would prefer to try the treatment pills first, as if I stopped away for a week, I would have to account for my time. So she's talking about work here. And Rasfara says, you are wise. It's the slow but sure way and you will be all right. You are fine and strong. The operation takes a lot out of you. So also as I've argued elsewhere, Irish, Irish women 
sought abortifacients and not instrumental procedures because they wanted privacy. Um, they wanted to obtain abortions in or near their own homes involving only a tight cohort of friends and neighbors. And thus they wanted to keep their reproductive decision-making within local networks. Um, how effective abortifacients are remains even controversial today. We don't necessarily know. Um, so we have plenty of evidence suggesting that if consuming a substance didn't work in procuring a miscarriage, um, women didn't give up. Then they proceeded to other procedures, more invasive procedures, um, including douching to clean out the womb or inserting a sharp, sharp object, object into the uterus to induce miscarriage. So this slide is a breakdown of the methods that women um, used according to criminal cases. Um, so you can see here that abortifacients are the most popular method here. And in these cases, um, in this chart, instruments or illegal operations are overrepresented because they're more dangerous and they result in more court cases. So if we look at the overall picture in terms of women's abortions, we think that um, abortifacients would be much higher. This slide here shows you some examples um, of methods used and descriptions of them. So on the top left here, we have sea tangle tents, which are the stem of a seaweed plant that, you know, a marine plant that can be used to dilate the cervix. On the top right is a um, syringe that was developed in the 19th century for enemas, but was used um, in abortions. On the bottom left is an advertisement in the newspaper for a so-called female pill. And these carefully coded pills were um, abortion causing pills. And on the bottom right is an inventory in a um, court case. And uh, there's thousands of items in this one court case that are documented by the court. And you can see that a lot of these are um, things like Detol and Jay's fluid, which are disinfectants that would have been used to clean instruments. So according to feminist scholars, we need to take seriously the words of women, the details recounted by the accused in um, illegal abortion cases that may have been irrelevant in law, but which mattered in the everyday lives of women. And so when we attempt to do this with Irish women's abortion narratives, we find intriguing evidence of the things that mattered in everyday lives. Um, so, a lot of the accounts that we see in court involve women talking about the spaces of abortion. A lot of them um, had abortions in kitchens, so these domestic spaces. Um, they talked about the ordinary things that were used in abortion attempts like soap, tea kettles, basins, bottles, grease or lard, disinfectants. Um, a county leashed woman who gave abortions to at least six neighbors actually used a, a regular teaspoon um, as her um, instrument. So women who also later recounted instrumental abortions in court um, talked about these instruments in terms of familiar objects. So they compared them to a, a golf tee, a knitting needle, and a shoehorn, for example. Um, so most cases that I've looked at also reveal important domestic health networks. So what I see here is a real persistence in women's traditional health care networks in which women assisted each other in home-based abortions with authorities entering the picture only when something went wrong. So um, I have a few slides here that tell you, walk you through some representative cases. So this one here is a case of Nell. She was 18 um, in Northern Ireland, unmarried, had a boyfriend, became pregnant. Her boyfriend refused to marry her. Um, she tells her grandmother what happened. Nell's grandmother tells Nell's mother, Mary, Mary gets together with her two best friends. The three of them try to give Nell an abortion in, a, in their home, in the home of Mary and Nell. It goes badly. They run down the street to um, get a nurse and a retired midwife. The nurses contact the doctor. The doctor contacts the police. Nell, in this case, ends up dying and they're all charged with murder. Another sort of representative case involves a woman named Wilhelmina who was 40 years old, married, had other children, and a history of difficult pregnancies. Um, when she became pregnant again, she sought the help of Kathleen, a neighbor. Kathleen visited Wilhelmina in Wilhelmina's home. She spent time with the family over several days, and this is the woman who performed abortions with a spoon. Um, as everybody waited for uh, a miscarriage to occur, 
people came in and out of Wilhelmina's home, mostly family, friends, and female neighbors. Her sister brought food. Wilhelmina also fell ill and died. Kathleen was arrested and charged with murder. And then in this case, as it came out in court, um, she was then charged with abortions on six other women. Again, I wanna make the point or emphasize the point that these are the rare cases, right? So um, these are women who died um, for the, as far as we can tell, you know, there is this, this myth in American abortion history and in Irish abortion history, the myth of the backstreet butcher, right? The myth that abortion was always dangerous and fatal. Um, it's the rare cases that, that suggest this. The statistics just don't back that up. Um, okay. So I'm really interested also in looking at how Irish women um, place their abortion experiences within like a moral context or how they explained it. And again, here, there are some things that I found that have really been surprising. Um, so most people associated with illegal abortion did not connect such practices with sin or morality. So while many judges and lawyers in court, some doctors, um, you know, asked women in court, you know, about sin or immorality, women really pushed back against this. So the following 1945 exchange is fascinating because even under cross-examination, the woman involved refuses to associate the practice with wrongdoing. So um, the italics are the lawyer asking her questions. The lawyer says, were you even aware that it was morally wrong to get rid of a pregnancy? And the woman says, in my case, I don't think so. And when you borrowed 70 pounds, you didn't think so? Didn't think what was wrong? Didn't think it was morally wrong to get rid of the pregnancy? And she says, no. And the lawyer persists. Mrs. M, you were aware that it was destroying life, though it was immature life? And she says, yes. He says, surely if you were not aware it was a criminal thing, your religious instruction would have told you it was a wrong, immoral thing to do. The woman pushes back saying, I told you I considered it was not an immoral thing to do for many reasons. My question was not so much directed to what you considered as to what you'd been taught, what I am taught, what I, am, what I think right. The lawyer says, you act in your own way and form your own views and you act upon them. Is that your motto in life? And she says, I certainly think about things. I don't accept things if I am just taught them. I discriminate. The lawyer um, responds, then it would be correct to say that you form your own views and act on them. And she says, yes. Researching illegal abortion in Latin America's recent history, Bonnie Shepard and Lisa Kelly explore what they call a double discourse system that supports formal public prohibitions in the face of widespread private violation. Um, so the makeshift illegal or unofficial abortion and reproductive health care practices that develop within these larger restrictive contexts serve as an alternative discourse that sometimes coexists with a dominant culture and sometimes disrupts it. Similarly, my research on Irish women's reproductive lives reveals a significant chasm between the official attitudes of the churches, states, and medical profession towards reproduction and the views and experiences of ordinary women. And almost all women um, who appear in court, even those who became seriously ill, would later say that the risks were worth it. Here we have a letter um, so the, the trial cases are fascinating if you go into the archive because they contain not only court transcripts but also evidence collected, including in some cases correspondence. Um, so here we have a letter written by a Dublin woman, Carmel, to her lover after her abortion. And it reads, Dear Dennis, you will be relieved, I'm sure, to know that everything is successfully over with no apparent ill effects. I ended up as an emergency case in Hollis Street Hospital. That's the uh, maternity hospital in Dublin. These last four months have been like a horrible nightmare. I cannot tell you how relieved and happy I am to know that the worry and sickness is at an end. The operations were naturally painful and a terrific nervous strain. However, that was my side of it, and I would like to think I faced up to it as decently as you did to yours. Very many thanks for your help, Dennis. Good luck and good wishes, Carmel. So Carmel here suggests that her four months of suffering and even nearly dying were worth it. Her description of the relief she felt after her successful abortion is telling because it places Irish women during illegality in a broader context. Relief, in fact, is the emotion that most women claim to experience after a successful abortion, no matter what the circumstances. Carmel here also talks about responsibility, her understanding that it was her responsibility to endure the suffering and to see the abortion through to its end and her lover's responsibility to pay for the procedure. So he pays for it, but he's not involved in any other way. 
So um, I hope these examples give you a little bit of an insight into what this was uh, illegal abortion was like for women in 20th century Ireland. And I'd like to conclude today by returning to the more recent past. So um, in the lead up to the repeal um, of the Eighth Amendment in 2018 that served to pave the way for the legalization of abortion in Ireland, there was a massive social media movement called In Her Shoes and lots of social media movements um, in which hundreds of Irish women posted about their abortion experiences, mostly travel to England um, between 1967 and um, 2018. And so these social media movements um, not only allowed women to talk about their experiences, but also we now know had a real effect on Irish people. Personal stories helped change people's minds about abortion. Um, so for a lot of these contributors to these social media movements, like In Her Shoes, posting was a radical act, right? It was one that they saw as deliberately rejecting the silence and shame of the Irish past. Um, and the creators of In Her Shoes basically said that they hoped the site would help Irish women recover their voices, express themselves, and talk about their lived realities in ways that their mothers, grandmothers, or great-grandmothers were not able to do. So while we can't deny that the world inhabited by these women's mothers, grandmothers, and great-grandmothers was a patriarchal one, one characterized by a public reluctance to hear or validate women's voices, if we look carefully, we can indeed recover some of those voices. Perhaps we can even begin to link the experiences of earlier generations with those that women endured in more recent decades. So I'm hoping that as it evolves, my research on abortion history will allow us to delve deeper into Irish women's embodied experiences, their interior worlds, and their stories, still obscured, but there, if we work hard enough to find them. Thanks. Thank you, Kara. That was so interesting and scary. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure we're going to have some questions. I had a couple of questions just off the top of my head. I was thinking about like the the sea journey from Ireland to the UK, like how many hours was that, how many days, that type of thing. And then my other question was about birth control. Um, yeah. which seems the obvious answer to everything. <laughs> right. Um, so the sea journey. So um, women who went to Britain for abortions did so after 1967. So most of them are flying and it's a very short flight. Some oh, of them are taking okay. the ferry. Um, you know, so it's not, it's, it's not a long trip, but it is in many ways a traumatic trip. Before 1967, we have some evidence that women traveled to the UK for abortions as well, but most of them would have gotten them illegally at home. Um, in terms of birth control, birth control is outlawed in Ireland until 1979. Um, and there's evidence that it's harder to get than an illegal abortion. Um, so there are some cases that I've looked at in which, you know, a, let's say a married couple attempts to get birth control, they're unsuccessful. They, you know, experience an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy and then they get an abortion. Um, yeah, and so even, even after 1979, it's hard to get birth control in Ireland, I would say until the 1990s. Yeah. Wow. Um, Sarah Redmond, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on what we in South Carolina and the United States may be um, uh, experiencing post Roe v. Wade when mm -hmm. abortion is illegal in this country. It will be illegal in this state if the Supreme Court upholds the recently passed um, six week abortion bill. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I, I would say a few things. One, I would say abortion is not going to go away. So the question is what, you know, what will happen? Um, I don't think we will see, it's, it's impossible to predict. I don't think we will see, you know, so-called backstreet practitioners coming back because what we have now is um, abortion, really effective abortion pills that you can get on the internet. So places like Women on Web, which is an organization in the Netherlands, will send abortion pills to 
women in places where abortion is criminalized or hard to access. I think that the future of abortion is home-based abortion pills, which is interesting to me as a historian because it's kind of like coming full circle, right? Um, so abortion traditionally was something that women did in the privacy of their own homes with their women's networks. And I think we're gonna return to that. Um, I don't know how accessible those types of things will be in a place like South Carolina. I also want to say, however, that I do think there is perhaps too much of a focus on legality, like I said at the beginning, because if we look at access to abortion, right? Um, so the fact that technically today, you know, right now, abortion is legal in South Carolina, but that doesn't mean it's available or accessible to so many women. So I think we have to expand the dialogue beyond legality and recognize that we're already in a situation in which it is impossible for many women to access abortion. I hope that answers your question. Do you just, that's due to clinics not being nearby or pressure from family or any number of reasons, I guess? Any number of reasons. So the, the lack of avail, available clinics, I think we've over-medicalized a process that doesn't need to be over-medicalized and it's scary to a lot of women. There are waiting periods there, you know, depending on where you are, there are forced ultrasounds, communication, is a problem. Transportation can be a problem. So all of these reasons, you know, and you know, women of color, people um, in rural, economically depressed areas really have a hard time accessing abortion. Um, Kevin Ganey, you have a question. You want to? Yes, I had a couple of questions. Um, I was just wondering, did you ever come across any cases where? Uh, the man and the where the woman wanted to get an abortion, the man did not. The woman went through with it, and then it was the man who turned her in. And uh, prior to the um, you know the era of modern pharmaceuticals, are there any actual natural substances that act as as birth control? Yeah. Um... So to answer your first question, no. <laughs> um, we don't have any evidence of that. We don't have any evidence of family or partners turning women in. Um, in fact, we have the opposite. We have evidence of support. Um, we do have a few, or I do have a few examples um, when, and this is especially in, in the case of unmarried women where the man doesn't really care what happens and he's not invested and not involved and, you know, um, doesn't take an active role in helping the woman seek abortion. And we have a few instances of married couples where the man later testifies that it was her idea. Um, so there's a little bit of a deflecting, you know, sometimes when if committed couples get in court, there's sometimes a blaming of the other. Um, in terms of natural substances, not that, that serve as contraceptives, but that serve as abortifacients. Yeah, there are a bunch of them. So um, Penny Royal is one, quinine, ergot. There's actually a book. There are some books published by, I don't have it here, but by, you know, um, feminists who, who describe some of these natural methods. Um, you know, I'm not saying I recommend them, but yes, Penny Royal is a big one. Quinine um, was used to you know, a lot of these substances were used um, to induce labor. Ergot, which is a naturally occurring fungus on rye is the, the natural basis for Pitocin today. So these are substances that induce uterine contractions. Um, a lot of other things like purgatives, so castor oil or something like that, if you take enough of them, you know, everything kind of comes up or comes out. Okay, um, Sharon Strong, do you want to ask your question? Can you unmute? You want, I can ask it for you. Um, no, Sharon, no, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about those um, Magdalene laundries where a bunch of so-called so fallen women ended up in Ireland, and I wonder about how um, you know, women who ended up in that situation versus women who were able to procure um, abortions otherwise. Um, I was just wondering about the role of those um, institutions in that mix. Yeah, right. So there's definitely sort of a couple different paths that 
paths that you can take or be forced to take um, if you're considered sexually deviant in 20th century Ireland. So Magdalene laundries are institutions for fallen women. And that could mean anything from being a victim of incest or rape to holding hands with a boy. And so these are usually young unmarried women. They're not pregnant when they're put in Magdalene laundries. Um, women who, unmarried women who um, become pregnant who do not for whatever reason um, successfully abort end up in other institutions which are called mother and baby homes. And these are the institutions that have been getting a lot of press in Ireland recently. So I don't know if you follow the news, but there is a government report that just came out on these because they discovered horrible abuse of women in these mother and baby homes. These are institutions where you would go to give birth um, and then your infant or child would be adopted out often to families in the United States. Um, they found in 2014, an amateur historian found 800 infant skeletons in the sewer of one of these mother and baby homes and that spurred this massive statewide investigation. This report that came out recently has been criticized because it did not take women's voices and the experiences of survivors seriously. It's a controversy in Ireland right now. We don't know much about these institutions because although they were state supported, they were church run and the church has no obligation to give up its archives and it has not opened its archives, hard to know. So it's impossible to know how many women who ended up in like, let's say a mother and baby home attempted abortion and it didn't work. Um, women who seem to successfully have aborted fetuses were ones who had either economic resources or perhaps more importantly, social resources, access to midwives, nurses, women with knowledge, those sorts of things. So it seems to be the women who didn't have these networks who ended up in the laundries or mother and baby homes. Great. Thank you. And um, Lisa Ross made a comment about 90% um, of counties in the United States have no 95% of counties in the United States have no abortion providers. That is mind boggling. I'm so used to being in Charleston County that has it. Um, yeah. Um, Barbara, do you wanna ask your question? Well, it's probably a mood. I'm just wondering how much, and I, I'm not just even talking airfare, but if you, you put that in there, how much did it cost these women to have these abortions performed by people who were, you know, um, more trained in abortion. Yeah, it varies widely. A lot of it is regional. Um, so if you, again, there's this distinction. So if you you are, the most abortions occur not, or are given not by these quasi professional backstreet pro providers, right? They're by women in neighborhoods, sometimes with some training in midwifery. Um, and those cases, it's rarely money that is exchanged. It's usually services that is exchanged or it's done, you know, for a pittance or for, you know, some crops or something like that. There are a minority of cases in Dublin in the 1930s and 40s where there's this expanding, you know, so-called professional backstreet abortionist network um, where a lot of women, unmarried women working in Dublin who don't have access to these women's networks um, this is where they tend to go. And these are, you know, more dangerous procedures. Um, and they can cost anywhere from like a week's wage to a month's wage. Um, so really economically um, prohibitive for many women, but it varies. There's no sort of rule in terms of how much it costs. All right, thank you. Wow. Well, uh... Any other questions? Yes, um, Bill, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, Professor, I was just, just very curious about um, in your research whether or not the, there were any indications of what, what benefit accrued to those who criminalized abortion, mm -hmm. who essentially are challenging um, these networks uh, and connections of, of women taking care of women. Um, and what, you know, where was the benefit? Was, did the church benefit from the criminalization of the state? Uh, was it specific politicians who ran on this issue? Mm -hmm. um, just seems very germane here in South Carolina. Yeah, so what we see is, um, so abortion is first criminalized in Ireland and the UK. So Ireland's part of the UK, a colony of the UK in the 19th century. So it's 1861, 
um, the Offenses Against the Person Act. And that, you know, it's also in the late 19th century that we see abortion criminalized in different states in the United States, right? So there's a late 19th century transatlantic movement to criminalize abortion. There are a couple different theories about what's going on here. The most, I think the most um, realistic one is that this is the, the era when the medical profession is rising the American Medical Association in the United States, for example, is the main campaigner against abortion and in favor of criminalizing abortion. So it's kind of viewed as a, an attempt to kind of um, once and for all dismantle women's traditional health networks and you know women midwives and that kind of thing, and force women into a modern, you know, controlled, contained, surveilled medical model. So it's viewed as sort of a medical takeover. It's not pitched as that. It's pitched as a moral issue. Um, you know, it's at that time that the Catholic Church, late 19th century, comes out officially against abortion. And a lot of people think it's earlier, but it's in the late 19th century. Um, there are also other things going on at the time. You know, there's a demographic crisis. There's a fear that people of color in the empire and immigrants are having babies while white middle-class women are not. So there's so many different things going on there, right? It's like the rise of eugenics. What happens in Ireland is that, um, so this 1861 Offenses Against the per Person Act is enforced across Ireland and the UK, but like I was saying, very reluctantly. So something has to go really wrong, usually for it, these laws to be enforced. Nobody's really that invested in prosecuting abortion cases. What happens in Ireland is um, we get this second criminalization of abortion in 1983, and that's in response to Roe versus Wade, and it's in response to the UK decriminalizing abortion in 1967. So this 1983 anti-abortion amendment is introduced after anti-abortion crusaders say, hey, Ireland, let's be different. Um, we don't want to be modern and secular like the UK and like the US, we don't want abortion to come here. So that's really a nationalist campaign that says Ireland will be different. Ireland's women are mothers. So there's this sort of conflation of motherhood and the nation. And that's the context in which we get the 1983 legislation. But it's very, there's so many things going on there. Wow. OK, um, Sally you. Preston, do you want to ask your question? So <laughs> listening to your answer um, to Bill, it, it made me wonder if you have any information about how the medical community in the US, their attitude is toward abortion today, if that's changed from needing to control it. Yeah, um, I, think, I think what's changed is that, you know, the AMA, for example, and the medical profession is largely responsible for criminalizing abortion, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 19th century. And then they take a leadership role in the 20th century in trying to decriminalize abortion, right? So they flip. Um, I, you know, it's not my expertise to, to talk to physicians today. Most physicians claim that they support legalized abortion. Um, you know, what I've been thinking about more and more and the issue I have is that it's become such an overly medicalized process um, there's been some research done on abortion clinics and spaces and how hostile they are, um, you know, and how how much of a change this medicalized system is from the way that women's health networks functioned traditionally. Um, there's been a movement in the UK to to recognize that um, successful abortions can be done not by doctors but by midwives, let's say, in people's homes. Um, I do, I think. I don't see a discussion today amongst physicians in the US or in Ireland about trying to make medicalized abortion more woman focused. Put it that way. Yeah, that might be unfair, but that, that would be my response. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you. This has been really eye opening, and I'm just glad we live in the present. <laughs> Not in that time period, but yeah. And uh, interesting about the what you just said about um, doing it at home versus going to a clinic. I would 
lean towards going to a clinic, but I guess there are <clears throat> yeah. improved methods of doing it at home that are safe now. Absolutely. Yeah. And there always have been, which is the point, right? That this yeah. myth that abortion was fatal and dangerous in the past. Yeah. Is a myth. These are the unusual cases. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Kara. That was great. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, please join us next week when uh, Kristen Graciano will be talking about her goals and expectations as Charleston's newly elected sheriff. All right. And thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good job, Laura.